Welcome to Home Brewer TV. Glad you joined us this week. We got a number of things to talk about. We got some tips, we got some letters. We're talking about making a kegel. And I want to announce we have a new sponsor, homebrewtalk.com, an incredible forum. Check them out, join us. You're going to get a lot of information there. So stay with me, let's get started. This segment sponsored by homebrewtalk.com. Join us and talk about your homebrew ideas, questions, recipes, or anything else to help with your homebrewing enjoyment. homebrewtalk.com. Join us on this great forum. <laughs> We're in the brew shop, enjoying a smoke peat porter. Oh, I love this beer. Mm. But we're here to talk about something that I've gotten a whole bunch of emails from you guys. And it seems that as though the idea of converting a keg to a brew pot has become really popular. And I could not agree more. Now, I would love to go out and buy one of those beautiful Blickman brew pots. I just don't have the cash to lay out $350 or $400 for something that I want to be able to brew a 10 gallon batch. Well, actually what these are are half cakes and they hold 15 and a half gallons. So you can brew five gallon batch, you can brew a 10 gallon batch and it's going to be great. Plus, this is the best part I think. I have checked with some distributors of beer and I won't mention exactly who they are, <clears throat> but what we've got are kegs available, and half the time it's because they're dinged up, they're ugly, whatever it might be, but 30 bucks for a stainless steel keg, I think that is a steal at any time. So, we're gonna convert this keg. Now, I gotta tell you, there are some incredible videos on the internet about how to cut the hole in the top. Well. I'm not going to go through that, but I am going to have a link below this video of a great YouTube video on how to do that. The guy does a fabulous job. Say hi to Bobby in New Jersey. After that hole's cut, well, what else do I want to do to this keg? Well, for me, it's a boil keg and that's what it's going to remain. So I think I need to add a valve to it. Very simply, a way to drain the boiled wort when we're done on our boil. I also ended up liking to have a sight tube. It, maybe it's just me. I like knowing how much liquid is in here. And if I end up getting too much liquid in here because I wasn't paying attention, well, I know I can boil a little longer and get it down to where I want the quantity to be for my fermenter. So this is my boil keg. I love it. It has worked so well for many, many years. But there's one thing to remember. You can convert kegs easily into a boil keg. But there are other things you need to think about when we are actually made that conversion. So what else do you need to add to your brew pot? Well, you're never going to get a boil on most kitchen stoves unless you've got a commercial stove of some sort. So you're going to need some kind of heat source. And a good propane burner works wonderful. Now this happens to be one that I use. I made the frame. I had scrap steel sitting around and I have a ball making my own things. So I made my own frame and added this burner. Now this burner works wonderfully. But I will tell you, if I was to go out and buy new burners for my brew system, I would find those nice banjo burners I really like what they're doing with them. I have some friends that use them and oh, they work great. So you're gonna need yourself a burner. So now we got our brew pot, we've got our burner and we have boiled our wort. But there's one other thing we need to do and we need to cool our wort quickly to be able to get it into the fermenter. Well, first of all, if you've got 10 gallons in this, we're talking a bit of weight and I know for me, I'm gonna have a hard time moving this around. 
Plus, you're going to have to find one heck of a big sink and lots of ice to cool it down like we've been doing with pots in our kitchen. So what do we need? We need some way of cooling this. The first thing that I ever was suggested to use was what's called an immersion cooler. Very simply, it's a big copper hose or line and my water supply comes in and out and this cools the wort. You put it into the brew kettle and what I do is I would always put it in about 15 minutes before the end of the boil and it sanitizes the coils so you never had to worry about your bringing in a microorganism problem. But here's what I don't like about these. Two things. I battled and battled getting hoses to be on the ends well enough that it didn't slightly drip. That just seemed to be a battle for me. The other one, which I even liked more, I liked more, that's not good, is it? I even liked less, is the fact that I have to move that chiller around in this wart, otherwise it takes forever to cool. So just sitting in the wart is not gonna do it. So what would I do? Well, I got hoses hooked to it, and I'd sit there and I would play with this. Up and down and up and down and around until it cooled it down. Well, that was quite a workout, quite honestly, and I didn't enjoy it. But it was effective, so it is an option. But I want to share with you another option that I think you'll enjoy even more. Now, it's my personal opinion that most people who create a brew pot of this sort they're into beer making, and they're going to be into beer making for a long time because they enjoy it. So, down the road, you're going to want to upgrade possibly to all grain, which, let me tell you, is such a fabulous way to go. So, here's some little tips of how I cool my wort that might save you a little money in the long run. Now, we talked about the immersion chiller, but a plate chiller, mm, it is the way to go. And I have a Chiron plate chiller. Now, there's many manufacturers out there. They all seem to be working really well. I've never heard a bad thing about a plate chiller if you use them correctly and think about the process. So I have my wort coming out of my boil bucket into a pump. Yes, you're going to need a pump. Unless you want to raise your boil bucket up high enough that maybe gravity will feed it down through your plate chiller. Personally, I love having pumps in my system. So I come down to my pump. I can regulate the amount of flow with a valve on my pump from the pump to the wart chiller. Out of the wart chiller, directly into Phi Fermenter. Two hoses that aren't on here, but of course would be, are my garden type hoses that bring in my cold water that do the water heat exchange. This system works fabulous. A good immersion chiller is probably going to run you mm, 60, 80 bucks, somewhere in that range. When you get into a plate chiller, you're probably talking 80 bucks and a little bit more. And when you are at a pump, well, I've seen pumps anywhere from $80 to hundred and a half. So you just kind of need a search to where you're going to find the best deals on them. Food grade pump, definitely what you're going to need. So that's my system for cooling, and it works so well that I can pump it as fast as the pump will pump, draining 10 gallons in no time into my stainless steel fermenter, and I'm at about 65 degrees. And my water temperature going into my chiller is about 55 degrees. Now, one little thing I'd like to show you, and that's these fittings. These are flared fittings that you can find at any hardware store, and they're very easy to use makes taking the brewery apart and cleaning a treat. But one key is you never want to over tighten these fittings. So basically put your wrench on and just barely bump it. That's all it takes. No tighter and you will be saving the flares and they will last you a lifetime. So now you have my suggestions for going to a big boil pot basically as inexpensively as you can. And let me tell you, once you get into full boils, you will never go back. And those of you who have wives, you won't be messing up the kitchen. You won't have to hear from them. <laughs> we'll see you next time. 
few weeks ago, we talked about using lubricant on your rubber seals of your kegs to help get rid of some of those nasty little leaks and make the kegs very efficient. Well, I was wandering along on one of the forums. I love the forums, such great people and such great information. And I came across a gentleman who had actually done some major research on this whole concept. But where he was going was the fact that some of these food grade lubricants, boy, are they pricey. And he's right. Well, he went into finding out exactly what these lubricants were and basically they're just mineral oil or petroleum jelly. So get yourself a little container of petroleum jelly, lube your things with it, use it very sparingly, and it's going to work for a whole lot less. Thank you forums for that information. I have so enjoyed getting all the emails that I'm getting from all you people who have questions for me. I love questions. And some of you have got some great ideas that, of course, we're using in the show. Well, we have a question here from Jason in Atlanta, Georgia. And he says, there are times when my fermentation seems to explode. It makes such a mess. Any suggestions? Well, Jason, let me tell you, I've been there. I can remember one time sound asleep in bed. This is the years when I had my fermentation in a hall bathroom because that was the cool dark place in the house. And all of a sudden I hear this screaming whistle. I bounce out of bed and find there's stuff all over the ceiling and walls and the fermentation had blown the lid basically off the bucket. Well, I'm now into conical fermenters, but I still experience the same thing. They can get extremely active and can make a mess. So here's what I do. I use this plastic container that holds about a half a gallon. And what I do is that what I put in there is some sterilized water. Then I have my blow off tube. It goes into the fermenter and into the plastic container. And it gurgles and bubbles and because of the size of the tube, it works better than those three piece uh, airlocks. However, I've also had this get so excited it ends up pouring over the side, and of course, whatever's below it is a mess. So, simple solution for that, grab a big old bucket. Put the whole thing in the bucket, and now it can go over, and it's never gonna fill this bucket so full that it spills. So, Jason, I hope it works for you, and you keep brewing because, oh, I love really active fermentations. We have two porters to try out in the tasting room today. Did you know porter beer originated in London, England? It was the most favorite beer of the ship and train porters of the time. And basically it was a very dark ale and it was the least expensive. Lighter ales were more expensive. So the porters really enjoyed the darker beer and it became extremely popular. It lost its popularity and almost went out of existence back in the early 1920s. But when the craft beer started coming back around, Porter came back around and it is really a fabulous style of beer. I personally love Porter. Well, today our first one we're going to try is Black Butte Porter from Deschutes Brewing. They're in Bend, Oregon. And they've been brewing since about 1988. I have to admit, there's been a few times that I have actually run out of my own beer, which I know I need to get smacked for that. But if I had to buy beer, Deschutes Black Butte Porter was what I went out and got because I really enjoy this beer. It's been a while since I've run out of beer, so it's been a while since I've had a Deschutes. So let's get started and see what we have. I know this is a lovely dark beer. It pours beautifully. You can see very, very dark brown beer. It's not black like a good stout, 
It's dark brown, has a gorgeous head. Oh, and it has an aroma that is wonderful. It will hit your nose, making you almost want to water up in the mouth, getting ready to sip it. And that's what we're going to do. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I have always enjoyed the Deschutes Porter. And I have to say, my opinion isn't going to change. This is a delicious, delicious beer. The hops and the malt are wonderfully balanced together. Definitely use some crystal and chocolate malts in here. And it is, oh, a great beer. I really like it. About 5.2% alcohol and about a 30 uh, international bittering unit. Good stuff. Well, our next one is from, as the people in London would say, across the pond. Well, it's a London porter, and aptly named since porter arrived from the world of London. Let's give this one a try. They have been brewing this beer for over 350 years. It's kind of amazing for us Americans, I think, to realize how old things are really happened in the old world of Europe and Britain. Well, I'm excited about trying this. I have not had one of these. However, this particular beer was rated number one porter in the world by the beer tasters of, I believe it's called Real Beer Tasting. So, I'm excited to have this taste. Well, it's pouring out lovely. I'm going to say it's basically the same color as the Deschutes. Oh, I can smell the aroma from here. Let me... Mm, all right. <clears throat> Whoa, this, <laughs> this one smells really good. I have to say, this has a much more malty smell than the Deschutes. Mmm, it just... Okay, this... Mm. I can see why this was rated the number one porter in the world. Now, I can't say personally, having tasted every porter in the world to make that a decision of my own, but this is really delicious. Oh, well, let's just get down to it. I believe the alcohol content of this one is about 5.4. And I'm going to say the IBUs, just from tasting it, is somewhere around 25. I liked both beers. I've expounded on the fact that I've always enjoyed Deschutes, and now the London Porter, spectacular. So, times for those old thumbs up. Well, Deschutes, you have always been one of my favorites. And for this particular tasting, I'm going to give you two thumbs up. London Porter, mm, you have won me over as a new London Porter drinker. This beer, I'm giving two and a half thumbs up. These beers are delicious. Give them both a try. They are both well worth your time. I want to thank you so much for joining me on this lovely day to talk beer, which I know we all love to do. I want to hear your comments and ideas, because everything you tell me, I take into consideration for this show, and you help make it better. So leave your comments in the box below, hit on the word comments, it'll let you in, and leave me a comment. Or, if you don't want to do that, send me an email. I love getting the emails. We'll see you next week on Homebrewer TV.